So gardening in October for us means making sure that you've got all of the harvest in before those first frosts come so that you don't lose anything or have anything damaged. So first up is our beans. So you can see here that they are nearing the very end of the life cycle. There's a lot of these. These are going to be our seed bean, which I've got a lot of videos you can go back and watch that show specifically harvesting your beans for seed and seed saving. But it's really important that we keep an eye out on the weather because if we have either a big rainstorm coming in or our first really heavy damaging frost, we don't want these to already, these to get wet. So they've been drying on the vine here. You can see they're very, very leathery. And so when I open these up, these beans are already beginning to dry. Now they're not dry enough to actually store a seed bean. They need to continue drying, which is why I'm not harvesting them yet. I'm leaving them out. Cause if I go like that with my thumbnail, so you see that indent. So that's a sign that these aren't dry enough to actually put in storage where they're sealed up. But if a heavy soaking rain comes through, it's going to rehydrate all of these. And then we have much higher potential for mold when we try to move them into storage. So before any big heavy rainstorms, all of the ones that have started to turn white and yellow and that are really getting close to being dry, all of those need to be picked. Now with your frost, the frost isn't going to actually damage the seed inside the bean as far as viability and being able to grow from these next year. But if you get really heavy frost, of course, you've got that ice, right? And then as the day, as the day warms up and it begins to thaw, it's introducing moisture back in. So there have been a few years where a frost has snuck in. It wasn't in the forecast and we woke up and we had frost and I've just had to come out and harvest the beans. But when that happens, then I have to actually shell everything out. Whereas if I just pick these right now at the height of the day when it's nice and warm and there's no dew on these, I can just put these in a big bucket or um, a bag and they will be fine until I can get around to shelling them out. But if they have been through a frost and have extra moisture, I can't do that. I actually have to sit and shell every single one of these out as I go to harvest it and then bring them in the house and put them out on trays and allow them to dry. So it's just a lot more work on my part up front. So I prefer to make sure that anything I wanna harvest for seed is done before a big rainstorm and or before going through a first frost. Now, when it comes to first frost and winter squash, a first frost is going to kill your winter squash plants, but it's not actually going to harm the squash. But usually once you start to get those first frosts and they come in, you don't have very warm daytime temps and that makes it harder to cure your winter squash for long-term storage. So here I've got some delicatas and I'm gonna leave these on the vine because winter squash, once harvested, does not continue to ripen. So you wanna leave them on the vine as long as possible if they're not already ripe. Now these ones are starting to turn. Um, you can see that there's getting to be a little bit of orange coloring in here. This is not a really, really pale, almost like a cream or a white. It's starting to get color. So that's a sign that these are actually starting to ripen. Another way is if you take, again, your thumbnail, it's a great indicator in the garden, and you press into it, I'm able to press into this and pierce it a little bit. So when your winter squash's outside rind or the skin is really hard and it's fully ripe, you can't press into it as well. So it's both a color indication and then also the hardness of the rind and or the skin. So I'm gonna leave these guys on the vine longer so that they can continue to ripen. But here I've got some of my acorn squash and one of the ways that you can tell with the acorn squash is the part that's touching the ground should be turning color. And I actually just broke that one off. So here we can tell one by size, this is a very good sized acorn squash, but we also have this discolor discoloring where it's in contact with the ground. So that's also a way to know that it's ripe. But you'll notice when I harvested this, you wanna make sure that you leave the stem on. And this is key for all of your winter squash if you plan on storing it throughout the months and into the winter, which we definitely do. However, if I wanna store this bad boy, that means that it needs to be cured. If you're curious about curing and how to cure winter squash, you can go over and watch this video and I'll walk you through every single step of that in there. Now, we do have some different varieties of beans and they are not quite ready yet. So I wanna walk you over and talk to you about shelled bean versus we were talking more about green beans and seed saving just earlier in the other part of the garden. Now these are called October beans. And the reason they're called October beans is because generally 
in my area, that is when they are actually ready to harvest. The other reason they're called October beans is because they are a seed bean that my family's been seed saving for generations and hundreds of years, and that's just what they've always called them. So I have no idea what they, their original variety they may have been called. That's what we call them. But these are a shelled bean. So as far as the seed saving goes, same thing as we were talking about seed saving, this, this is the ones, these are the ones, I can use proper grammar, um, that have been drying and are a lot more mature. So these are drying on the vine, but these are only used as a shelled bean, or that's the only way we use them. They develop a really large bean inside the pod. So the ones that I plan on using for seed saving, they need to be fully developed like I'm allowing these to, and these would need to be harvested before the first frost. However, these ones here, you can see these are, this one is still actually fairly immature. It's just starting to get bumpy and develop inside, but there's still quite a bit of green, whereas this one is more scarlet streaked with some of the cream. But if these get hit by a frost, not a big deal. They won't continue to develop any further from the point that they get hit with a frost, but that's when I would just come out and pick these and I'm gonna shell them and just use them as a shelled eating bean. And I usually end up canning them when we're, they're at this point if there's, um, if there's, if they've all gotten points to the part of maturity where I can just have them be a dried bean, that's awesome. I'll use them as both the dried bean and the seed bean. But if they're at this part when the frost hits, then I will shell out, usually cook up a big fresh mess for dinner. And then if there's extra beyond that, then that is when I will just go ahead and can them up as a fresh bean, which is actually much easier to can a shelled bean when it's freshly harvested like this, because you don't have to do the longer soak periods. You can do a raw pack with the pressure canner still. So it's actually a much faster canning process. So you have a little bit more leeway with your shelled beans and frost uh, than you do with green beans and or with your seed saving aspects. So when it comes to your warm weather crops, some of them you can protect for those first from those first few frosts to extend the harvest time. So I have been growing my peppers here in this cold frame actually all season long and we're still warm enough right now and during the day uh, hot enough that I don't need to have this buttoned up and the, the lids and the top on to protect them. But as we get closer to having some frost in those overnight lows, I've still got some small peppers and I've got some blossoms actually that are still forming, meaning I could continue to get peppers off of some of these plants. They actually do need some water as I was just looking at these. So I'll get them a good water. They're gonna bounce back fine. So keeping an eye on those overnights, if you've got your cold frames and whatnot, can allow you to extend the harvest to let some of them finish developing for at least a couple of more weeks and just give you a few more weeks growing time. So I'll be keeping an eye out on the, har on the overnight lows, I should say, and we'll then put the lids back on here and button it up to protect it from those first few frosts. A couple things to keep in mind though, especially with things like peppers and or tomatoes that are very, very sensitive to frost, is if there's any of the leaves or part of the plant that's actually touching what your covering is, so it's mainly this plant. Um, if it's actually touching the wall, it can still transfer the coldness and the ice if it's directly touching. You actually want a buffer space, like we have here, of air, because otherwise it will get damaged. Now, it probably wouldn't kill the whole plant depending on how much is actually touching it, but I'll need to come through and actually just stake this and pull it back so that it's not actually touching. Otherwise, it would end up probably killing a good portion of this plant or damaging it if it goes through a frost while it's in the cold frame. So now we need to attend to our potatoes. So when you get your first killing frost, which is usually needs to be about 28 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, for your warm weather crops that are really sensitive, like basil, peppers, and tomatoes, even you know 31, 32 degrees is gonna take them out in most cases. But this is one of my last potato vines that's just hanging on. They're just at the end of their life cycle. So the above ground part, which is, is your vine part of the potato, this will start to die back. So you can see this one has already died back. There's just a few that are left hanging on here and they will all be died back. So once that happens, and if a frost comes through, it's gonna just kill this back anyways. So you'll want to cure your potatoes, especially the ones that you wanna keep for long storage eating. Now, potatoes you wanna eat that night or within the next week or so, you don't need to bother with curing them. But for any that you plan on storing, we wanna make sure we cure them. So the first thing, and this seems so counterintuitive, is if you are curing your potatoes, don't 
wash them. Leave the dirt on. You don't want to put any more moisture into them because the act of curing is drying out that outer layer and getting moisture off of the surface, hardening that up so that moisture and bacteria and excess oxygen don't get in and break down and cause the potato or whatever it is that we're curing uh, to, to rot and to decay faster. So just trust me, don't wash them. You wanna lay them out evenly where you have good ventilation so that they can harden up and go through the curing process, which usually takes a couple of weeks. Then after that, you can brush off any excess dirt because by that point it'll be nice and dry and it's easy to, to dust off. But again, don't wash them after curing either. You'll wash them right before use. Now, the easiest and best way for me to store potatoes is to actually leave them in the ground. I have a full video releasing on that next week so you can know with your climate if that's an option for you and the steps you need to take in order to ensure that you have success. Now, one of the other fall crops that you may have still going in your garden is Brussels sprouts. So go and check out this video to see what to do with your Brussels sprouts or if you wanna grow Brussels sprouts, right here.